Hi folks, this is Abel James and thank you so much for listening to Fat Burning Man where we talk about real food and real results. This week returning to the show is Kiefer, the man who came up with carb backloading, carb night, and other internet sensations that show you how to have a ton of fun while getting into the best shape of your life. He'll probably ruffle a few feathers in this interview since lately he's been trashing paleo on his blog. Stay tuned and learn why in today's interview. I wanted to let you know before we get to the show, we just released the Wild Diet Shopping Guide, which is a handy little ebook that shows you how to save money and time while cooking the healthiest food you can for you and your family. If you'd like to check it out, head on over to my blog at fatburningman.com. I think you'll like it. And also, if you'd like a free guide on how to get fit by exercising less and by eating some of the most delicious food you could ever imagine right up Kiefer's Alley, as a matter of fact, like grass-fed burgers stuffed with avocado, guacamole, paleo pancakes, and even treats like cheesecake, go to fatburningman.com right now and enter your best email address to get your free fat-burning downloads and podcast updates straight to your inbox. You'll never miss a show again. In the meantime... Here's the review of the week. This is for my new book, The Wild Diet. Uh, Five stars from Samantha Frost. Hi, Samantha. Uh, She says, I read this book in two days. It was absolutely fascinating and also extremely motivating. It's definitely worth a read. This is what the paleo community has been missing. Less rules and more science. Thanks so much for saying that, Samantha. I I believe that no one is 100% right all the time. That's one of the things we're going to be talking about in this interview, in fact. And it's important to kind of simplify a lot of the things that we know work, like fundamental exercises that strengthen the core and the large muscles of the body, like squats, push-ups, pull-ups, simple old-fashioned rows, things like that. Basically, I wanted with this book to demystify what it means to be healthy and happy at the same time, because it really is possible, and it's a lot more simple and straightforward. Um, than than some dogmatic plans that kind of make things super complicated uh, turn out to be. So check out The Wild Diet if you haven't already. A lot of people are saying good things, and I really appreciate you guys reading it. So all right, on to the show with Kiefer. Here's a little bio. Kiefer sees himself first and foremost as a geek with a master's in physics, a former career in software engineering, and the occasional time wasted working on abstruse mathematical problems. (laughs) It's no surprise. But with a personal motto like a sound mind in a sound body, he is also obsessed with human high performance, particularly his own. On this show, you'll learn a little bit about ketogenic dieting why these diets work and the mistakes you might be making if you're trying to follow a ketogenic, high-fat, low-carb type diet. Uh, Also, you'll learn why spiking insulin may actually be beneficial, why it's good to be wrong, and what to do about it, and also why Kiefer is trashing paleo on his blog and much more. All right, let's go hang out with him. All right, folks, I am very happy to be here today with Kiefer, a former mathematician and brainiac, now the man behind the phenomenon of carb backloading. How's it going, man? Good. How are you? It's been a while <laughs> since we've talked, actually. It's been too long. We got, uh, if I recall, some guacamole covered omelets at one point, which was too long ago in Austin, right? <laughs> yeah, that was over, that was like almost two years ago. It's crazy. Crazy. Wow. But yeah. anyway, you've been busy. You've been uh, writing articles trashing the paleo movement, <laughs> uh, <laughs> right. upgrading uh, your approach to carb backloading. Um, are you 40 yet or about to turn? You're, you're in the ballpark, right? I turned 40 on January 31st. Right on. Congratulations. Yeah. So we'll have to talk about that too. Actually, I was literally doing an interview for someone else uh, this morning on their show, and they were talking about... Um, you and how awesome you are and <laughs> a bunch of stuff like that. But they had specific questions about performance as you age, which we'll kind of get to a little bit later. But I wanted to start one of the subjects our readers and listeners have been talking about so much lately is uh, about ketogenic diets, why they work, what to do, how to, how to manage them, the roadblocks that they uh, come up against. So why don't we kind of like uh, start with a quick little background about who you are, what you do, and then we'll go straight into that. Uh, yeah, the quick and dirty, always, always been of the science mind. Um, I remember I spent my childhood locked in my bedroom with math books, just <laughs> doing problems, not even because I had to, just because 
I wanted to. So I can tell you I had no social life whatsoever. Sure. Um, growing up. And, uh, you know, that, that kind of interest just parlayed into, well, you know, as a fat kid and I, I was bullied, you know, by the common definition of bullying, which, you know, for better or for worse, it created all of this because I wanted mm-hmm. to change um, what I was getting made fun of for, which was, you know, being fat and unathletic. And when magazines failed, uh, I started going to the medical libraries. So it was, you know, a very simple segue from spending all day in a math book to spending all day trying to understand the scientific papers. Sure. And I just continued that uh, pretty much from the age of 17 until now. Um, so, you know, I remember the days before the Internet when you had to go find the journal, make Xerox copies and carry home loads of papers to sort through. Yeah. Yeah, so, and then, uh, you know, went to graduate school in uh, physics. I got undergrads in both math and physics, went Mm -hmm. to grad school in physics. And it just, luckily, that course actually kept me near schools that had just extensive medical libraries. So I was always able to keep up on that side of things. The the biggest part of my background that's kept everything moving forward is I just always think I'm wrong. (laughs) And uh, I, I mean, as cool as things are and as well as they work, yeah, I just, you know, I've always got that in the back of my mind. Well, what if I'm wrong? What what's wrong? What am I missing? Yeah, because um, it's happened so many times. Right. Um, so, th- th- you know, that's kind of the background and just always making sure I'm right um, and trying to do that in the best way to help, you know, everybody that's out there to make it simpler to make it easier or to answer their questions when you've got so many opposing sides to these issues, especially the ketogenic diet. You've got yeah. People who are so pro ketogenic never eat carbs. Um, they're going to kill you. You got to keep insulin levels almost zero. Mm-hmm. Um, and then you have the other group that's like, well, well, where's the data? You know, we're missing some key points mm-hmm. in your argument. And if you ignore those people and just say, well, they just don't understand the science, I, I think you kind of get trapped into an ideology, which is one thing I went into with the paleo series. They're missing mm-hmm. so much biochemistry and physiology because they really want to believe in this story. Mm-hmm. And and we've got that on both sides of the fence with ketogenic and non-ketogenic people now too. They just right. – they really want to believe their story and if they would – if at least the ketogenic side, which in my opinion is they have a stronger scientific basis than the other side, if they would sure. listen – they would start to dig a little deeper, and that's what I've actually been doing over the last year. So I have an entirely new argument and basis for the ketogenic diet and actually defenses for carb night and even actually defenses for eating on carb night or carb backloading. There's actually more stuff pointing to the fact that you should – choose you know things like uh, table sugar and high fructose corn syrup um, oddly enough those things have a very distinct use in these type of diets oh boy. Uh, here we go <laughs> yeah and, and I'm not trying to say eat junk and I you know I don't it, it, it's a fine line and that's why I'm totally I've decided to rewrite carb night first because it is prerequisite material to understanding carb backloading too there's sure. no way you could understand carb backloading too Um, unless you understand this new basis. So I'm actually in the process of getting both of those written at the same time, which is a massive nightmare. (laughs) That's that's all I can say. I've got, you know, I've hired researchers to help me, you know, clean up the research and dig even deeper. Um, I've got, you know, nice, great editors trying. It's just, you know, managing all that stuff. It's like, this is a nightmare. I liked it so much more when nobody knew who I was and I just wrote this stuff for fun. Isn't that funny? I I can totally relate to that. It's like, when I was scrappy and first getting started and taking down <laughs> Jillian Michaels from the top of the podcast dress, it was so fun. And like there was, there was, uh, it felt like everything was at stake, but looking compared to now, it's like nothing was at stake then compared to the things that, I, I mean, I, I, I've seen you get slaughtered on the internet by people and I, I get slaughtered too, which is, <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, it's sometimes uh, it's inevitable to either be wrong about something or bite your tongue. And, you know, not attack someone back for saying something that you disagree with. But yeah, I think it's, but... it's really important to see how how similar a lot of these points that we're making are. Like, when you look at ketosis, maybe it's not correct that we should always avoid carbs at all costs. Or on the other side, you know, do the opposite of that. Maybe both of those are wrong. 
and there are different circumstances. So let's talk about some of the things that, that maybe you were wrong about, the, the ones that were the most surprising for you. Anything from, you know, carb night or, or backloading that you thought was one way, but perhaps is another? Yeah, that's going to open up a can of worms. <laughs> <laughs> That's why you're here. So I'm pretty much convinced that the insulin hypothesis as it stands is totally wrong. Um, <laughs> insulin is not the culprit that is causing issues. Uh, and, and that came up because so many people made actually really good arguments about insulin release uh, when you have other types of meals. Right. It, it's almost unavoidable. When you eat food, you get a uh, GLP-1 increase, uh, glucagon-like peptide 1, mm -hmm. uh, which will make you release insulin regardless. Uh, so you have that. Certain proteins have really strong insulin responses. Uh, but we still see fat loss in those instances. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I just started looking deeper into it. And insulin alone isn't actually – what I would say is the main problem, uh, it's a combination of effects. It's very distinctly, very distinctly insulin plus glucose. So basically, in essence, the question is, um, and a good point that high car people make, mm -hmm. is that insulin levels are not always chronically elevated. That only happens once you're sick and diabetic. Yeah. But part of the insulin and ketosis, you know, insulin control and ketosis is the solution. Part of their argument is, well, insulin's high all the time. Therefore, you know, that's what's you know, forcing extra nutrients into fat tissue and so on and so forth and causing mm -hmm. insensitivity. But that doesn't jive. It just logically doesn't make sense. And that's where I would have to give Alan Aragon kudos um, in that sense for really driving that point home. Yeah. So then what we would want to look at is, is there an incremental effect, damaging effect that we, that could accumulate over time that is not related to constant exposure to say insulin or carbohydrates because you know blood sugar is only elevated for certain amounts of time if you're healthy insulin's only elevated for certain amounts of time if you're healthy mm -hmm. so the question is is there some some incremental damage that's being done that builds up over time that would cause what we do see uh, and the answer is yes yeah. and it distinctly relates to glucose being available for fuel, fat being available for fuel, which it always is, and insulin levels being elevated. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to get into too much of the detail until I, I come out with a book, but you can show, and there is an unbelievable amount of evidence that's out there under everybody's nose, that even just intermittent exposure multiple times a day is enough to cause accumulating damage hmm. that would cause these that would cause them all the metabolic derangement that we see. You can actually very, very strong relation to cancer, to Alzheimer's. I mean, almost to the point of, you know, it, it's like a smoking gun, like all the data that's out there. I was, I just thought it was ridiculous when I started going down that rabbit hole. Yeah. Um, how much is being missed and actually it completely nullifies the keto. It, it changes the context of the ketogenic diet. It's like, okay, ketogenic diet ketones are so awesome we need to be ketogenic and you have a lot of people who say this mm -hmm. um, but the question is is it really the ketones that are making the difference or is it the absence of other fuels right, right. and yeah and I, I think the real answer is it's the absence of other fuels mm -hmm. which kind of uh, leads to fasting or ketogenic type behavior I guess you could say for the majority of the day and and kind of what you've been talking about for quite some time, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and that's the nice thing. If you have, so, you know, I'm a physicist and what I went to grad school to study was, is called the grand unified theory. It's bringing all, you know, everything we know about physics into one consistent framework, which mm -hmm. there's still a lot of work being done on that. And that's what scientists and physicists in particular love to do. They want one theory that everything we observe is just a specific instance of that theory in that context. And what I have, you know, what I've been formulating ex can explain everything we see. So it can explain why intermittent fasting has the characteristics that it has mm -hmm. um, and why some of those characteristics are very sim similar to car backloading. Right. It can tell us why, at least in the clinical setting with Rocky, and I am actually trying to get a um, university study done on carb night now. Cool. Um, yeah, it shows us why we do see 
with carbonite, people have more rapid fat loss than they do, at least in his, his clinical experience and setting. So this, this is not, you know, well controlled yet, but he does see more rapid fat loss in the patients who use carbonite than the patients who come in and try to go strictly ketogenic. So basically what that is, the, the gist of it is doing a carb refeed in the evening. Correct. Uh, so that's carb acclimating. Yeah. So for the people who don't know, carb acclimating is essentially you're doing a carb refeeding mm-hmm. every evening, and then carb night. That diet is you do carb feeding just once a week. Yeah, that's kind of closer to what I do. It, maybe it'll be a, a couple of times a week, but mm-hmm. I find a, a tremendous benefit in doing the refeed. Have, having not done it for uh, a series of of weeks that were consecutive, mm-hmm. uh, I could tell that my hormones were going out of whack, and I did some testing, and they were. Mm-hmm. And it was, it was fascinating to feel how obvious that was, <laughs> you know, yeah, but then the, the sweet potatoes were great. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I love, so, oh, so here's a question for you. Are sweet potatoes paleo or not? <laughs> I'm going to ask. Oh, but, you and know, you, you didn't. Yeah. And then I know you didn't read my articles yet on paleo, so you don't have the cheat sheet to answer that. Well, here's my problem. <laughs> you can walk into Whole Foods. Like we're, we're in Nashville right now and mm-hmm. we walked into uh, Whole Foods last night and there was a, uh, I think it said like a paleo meals or, you know, on that fake chalkboard writing that was over the hot bar mm-hmm. and the hot bar had all of this food pretty much was cooked with GMO canola oil, which <laughs> to their credit in the original paleo book is totally correct and totally cool because mm-hmm. men ate canola oil, I guess. You can also walk into Whole Foods and get, you know, these paleo bars or caveman cookies or whatever that have 25 freaking grams of sugar in it. But it's cool because it's honey, you know, and cavemen ate honey. So that to me, that's the problem is that it's such an easy thing to abuse that people who are just walking in seeing that buzzword are getting the wrong idea from food marketing companies. Just, you know, the way that every other diet is ruined. I, I think paleo isn't immune to that. Now, if you're talking about eating like your ancestors, that's a totally different thing. But to your point, I think what, what we talked about before this call uh, is that it's a story and it's one that there isn't much science on. The, the story itself, who was eating what, when, uh, it gets a little icky. Right. Yeah. And, you know, some of the story is just flat out wrong. I um, The second part in the series that I have out uh, part three is coming out next week or in a couple, you know, whenever this is coming out. Um, in part two, we actually have an amazing amount of evidence that shows dairy has been in the human diet for about 11,000 years. And we even can trace back our ability to adapt to it, which was roughly within a thousand year time span. We were able to adapt, at least in Europeans, to the inclusion of dairy in the diet. Um, wheat nice, because I love gluten. dairy, and I've been eating a lot of it for a long yeah. time. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, you know, if you're not lactose intolerant, there's really no reason you shouldn't. Yeah. Um, you know, wheat, we've got enough archaeological evidence to show that we've been eating gluten-containing grains mm-hmm. uh, for at least 23,000 years. Yeah, e- They even have, you know, early grinding stones from that period, which means we were, you know, getting the husk off of them and eating those foodstuffs. So... Again, and that relates to what I'm doing now, it, it's, you know, what was the amount of exposure? And so everybody, I believe everybody and maybe your, your, your I'm sure your ancestral background informs it somewhat, but mm-hmm. what is the level of glucose exposure that you can handle right. without getting sick? And I right. think that's the really big question that nobody's, nobody's coming at it from that context. It's always just no no carbs or, yeah, eat carbs all the time. Right. That's true, isn't it? Um, yeah. But I can say from a lifestyle perspective, having carbs at night is the best thing ever. Um, and avoiding them during the day is too. Uh, you don't really miss them. You have great energy during the day. And then when you need to um, basically give yourself that food coma in the evening, it's a, it's a brilliant <laughs> time to experience that. It's the right time. Yeah, yeah, I've been uh, digging up. It's interesting stress, stress response, and circadian rhythms, mm-hmm. and some things, because I find if I'm already kind of mellowing out in the evening and I don't have anything planned, and I have carbs, then it just you know keeps me mellow and I'm ready to for bed. Mm-hmm. If I've been hyper productive that day and just need to, and it's dinner time and I have carbs, my productivity goes up. 
So I've been curious, and there's some data. I'm, yeah, I'm still digging into it, but there seems to be a cortisol psychological. Yeah, there's a there's a psychological component that relates to both car- cortisol and the effects of what will happen when you get certain hormone surges. Hmm. Um, you know, based on what your day is like. Yeah. Uh, so oh, that's a good you, one. Yeah, th- yeah. When I st- you know I I've noticed it for a while, but I never really dug into it, and with you know, some of the new stuff I was doing, I was like, well, you know, I should pin that down because it's very consistent for me. Mm -hmm. Uh, Last night was a good example. I, you know, I've been working on some algorithm stuff for the software um, that I guess I haven't actually talked about on since we've been uh, recording. Yeah, go for it. (laughs) Yeah, I was, I was working on some of that algorithm stuff uh, last night. And so my brain was on overdrive and I had dinner and I was up till two in the morning, just, you know, very productive. But I did have a lull right before dinner. I had dinner, which was actually a cheeseburger with salsa verde, French <laughs> fries and some jalapeno poppers. Nice. Um, yeah. And and then, you know, I, I was like I was instantly charged again and went till two in the morning without really a drop in energy. But wow. over the weekend when I was not working you know, I had something pretty much cool. It, actually, I think it was the exact same meal. I went to the same restaurant. Uh, I fell asleep by 930. I came home. I was sluggish and I laid down and I just passed out. Hmm. And and that's been very, very consistent for me for, I mean, as long as I've been kind of paying attention, which is like the last year and a half or so. Yeah. Let me ask you this. So from a productivity standpoint, what's what's your best eating plan for that personally? Definitely carb backloading. The more, I, well, and, and also some protein backloading. I do best if I start the day with mostly fat, a mm-hmm. little bit of protein. I don't pay too much attention to it, but some fat and then um, pr- actually, you know, pretty high fat, not too high on protein all the way through until the evening. Mm-hmm. And then if I feel a lull, then I'll have a carb meal. And it'll pick me back up in productivity. If I'm not feeling a lull, then I'll, you know, I'll just stick to the low carb. Okay. What time do you usually go to sleep? Mm, oh, uh, there's no <laughs> usual right now. I would say on average, I'm asleep by about 1 a.m. Okay. And I have to get up for my, my dog Cooper at about 6. Oh, geez. Yeah. So that's, and the, my wake up time is absolute. He won't let me sleep past 6. Sure. Um, but my bedtime could fluctuate literally from nine thirty till two or three in the morning. Interesting. Right now. Yeah, there's just I, I bit off way more than I could chew. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then what about exercise? Like if if you go from kind of a high stress, low sleep environment to the next day, do you on purpose kind of avoid a heavy lift or an intense exercise session, or do you keep going for it? Like like what happens? I kind of, I gauge it. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'll notice if, especially if I'm sleep deprived in an instance of say I went to bed at three in the morning, I was up at six uh, for Cooper. Then, you know, I'll notice that my, my stress response is through the roof. You know, Mm -hmm. I can feel it uh, to the point of being a little jittery and I'll actually go into the gym and, and work a little heavier, but not as long of a duration of a workout because Mm -hmm. that actually helps calm down my nervous system a lot. Okay. Um, yeah, it just kind of, it settles it down and then I feel actually normal after that. If I'm just sleep deprived, but I don't have that massive stress response, uh, then I'll usually do either super light workout if I go in or I'll just skip the workout that day. Yeah, that makes yeah. sense. I've, I've been, um, experimenting recently ever since, uh, last August I broke my foot. So that basically like ruined all of my <laughs> yeah. exercise strategies. Um, how'd you break your foot? Or can, or can you not share? Is it one of those? No, uh, no. Well, oh. it was one of those. I've never broken a bone before in my life. And I was with Pedram Shojai, who's been on the show before. He's a, he makes documentaries and uh, is a Taoist <laughs> oh. <laughs> and, and a maniac. And so um, I actually had the manuscript for my book in my backpack and my phone and a bunch of other stuff. And he told me that we were going bouldering. And so you know, where I'm from, that means that you go, you climb boulders and you bring like Mm -hmm. a pack and we were going to film a new TV show and stuff like that. But all of a sudden there was water involved. Like he brought us to to a different place and where you needed to like totally stick a landing. You're basically hanging on one side of this, this rock face. And then you need to like 
flip around 180 degrees <laughs> and land on this little thing. And so I, I was wearing my Pocahontas sandals, you know, the, the minimalist stuff, mm -hmm. which usually serves me just fine. But, uh, you know, knowing that I had to stick it or else I, I can't tell you how many dreams I've had about, you know, the stuff in my backpack or my phone falling in the water. <laughs> like, yeah. That's one of my recurring yeah. nightmares. And so anyway, I'm just like, OK, I'm going to totally stick it. And then I stuck it. And as I did, I realized I made a huge mistake. My, my foot just, you know, broke. Oh, man. Um, <laughs> which, yeah, which was totally lame. A week before Burning Man. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, um, so I had to kind of like reevaluate how I exercise and, uh, it's been really cool pretty much ever since I've been doing maybe just two minutes of kind of high intensity exercises like handstand pushups or fingertip pushups or, uh, you know, hill sprints or something like that with a max of like five minutes, but basically just enough to kind of get that, you know, full body pump type feel. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. when you're yeah. really kind of cycling everything out uh, and it's amazing what it's done for stress in terms of if I do that that day, I feel pretty rocking for the rest of the day. And usually I'll do it in the morning. But if I don't, I feel kind of like sluggish, like I never actually activated my biochemistry that day, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, totally. Uh, I'm a big proponent of getting moving first thing of the day or like, I mean, you're just amping up your, your nervous system right away, which is right. fantastic. Uh, I usually try to take Cooper for, it's like a three mile walk around the lake. Nice. Um, yeah, a mile walk and I'm, I still feel a little sluggish, but at the end of three miles, I, my body's pretty, pretty awake and it's good exercise for Cooper. Yeah. And, and then the workout will, you know, take that to the next level if I need to, or that, you know, that might be enough for the day, depending on you know, my sleep schedule and all that kind of stuff. Right. Totally. So let me ask you this. Cause, um, like I said earlier, I was doing another interview, um, today where one of the guys is in his, uh, mid fifties. The other guy was in his late fifties and they were talking about, they, they trained with guys who are a lot younger than them, faster, more mobile in a lot of cases. So they need to really keep up. And the specific question was, this, this one guy, basically, when he gets to around 12% body fat, which he can easily do if he wants to, his performance goes down, his inflammation goes up, and he's not nearly as athletic as he is when he's at around 14%, which he doesn't look or feel quite as good, but his performance is much better. Uh, and mm -hmm. he's seen that kind of like across a lot of people at his gym and some of his patients as well. He wanted to know why that might be true. Cholesterol, testosterone... What do you think? Uh, there could be some testosterone effects. Honestly, I would guess uh, there could be a lack of, so, you know, adipose tissue is actually great for, uh, you know, it's going to obviously depend on diet. Sure. I'm, I'm going to qualify that. But uh, fat cells have a great capacity to either deactivate or activate cortisol uh, from cortisone to cor to the act cortisone, the storage form of cortisol to mm -hmm. the active form cortisol. So, I mean, he could be seeing, um, a lack of efficacy of the stress response in a positive way because mm. cortisol can be anti-inflammatory, right? Um, especially in the evening and in the morning if you're not eating carbohydrates. So it could be that effect, yeah. um, could be testosterone could be uh, you know dietary considerations are always there i you actually uh, see this with younger athletes too mm -hmm. this isn't necessarily an older athlete kind of thing as they start to lean down they they do their perform especially if they came from a place of higher body fat and they right. lean down yeah they're usually just and i'm like that uh, when i get extremely lean and i'm you know, at high performance, mm -hmm. my joints start to get sore. Um, I notice getting up in the morning is a lot more difficult at first, you know, it just feels like my body's not, not right. And to be honest, I haven't looked into that as much as I probably <laughs> should have. <laughs> What's the threshold would you say for you anyway, in, in terms of body fat percentage, you know, around, around eight mm -hmm. or six now yeah. is when I actually can start to feel a little miserable right <laughs> from working out yeah like you know at night when i sleep my arms will go numb oh you know, really it's almost yeah i'm if as my body fat decreases and then my performance goes up huh. um, i just kind of notice these weird things like i don't know i don't have the right cushioning to prevent me from 
um, you know, cutting off circulation in the evening, you right. know, just kind of weird stuff. And, and that's about the threshold when I'm around there, I'm, I'm really not super happy. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I look great. And, you know, after a carb night, I look unbelievable because, you know, <laughs> my muscles are so full and they're stretching what little fat is there. You right. know, it's, it's an awesome aesthetic. Yeah. Um, but I'm definitely not as happy uh, when I'm there. Have Have you noticed, you know, you, you recently turned 40. We have a lot of people who are uh, over 40 listening to the show. Have you made any adjustments or have you helped others make adjustments if they are a little bit older? They're not young athletes anymore. Like how does this, this lifestyle apply to them? For myself, it, it's really hard for me to answer because my goals have changed so much over the years. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, in my late 20s and 30s, I had some serious performance goals that I wanted to hit. Mm -hmm. uh, and those were those were very important. And now, you know, my late 30s and now early 40s, I my my goals are more oriented towards my business and trying to help people. Mm -hmm. um, so that's, you know, that's a big shift for me. For older people who started out working older, I don't depending on their diet and where they've been. As far as diving in, I don't see a lot of difference. Yeah. Um, they seem to be able to handle things fine. As far as, and then as you start getting up more into performance, really the recovery becomes kind of the key factor. And so with recovery, you also have to just look at what's your workload. Mm -hmm. Actually, my, I'm really, you know, kind of best friends with my ex wife, and she's dating this guy who's in CrossFit. Mm -hmm. And he's now 47, 48. And he's like, oh, you know, I, yeah, it just, I'm going to have to give up working out because when I do these CrossFit workouts, I'm just so sore and I'm beat up. And, he, and it's like, you know, whatever your dietary choices are, you just don't have the capacity to recover like you once did. Yeah. And I would make the argument based on my new theories that that's because of the degradation we've done over the years, period. Even mm -hmm. if you're a phenomenal athlete and you're on a high glucose diet uh, pretty regularly, you are doing incremental damage. It's just going to take a lot longer to show up. And where it will show up first is an inability to recover like when you were young. Yeah. And so, uh, you know, to mitigate that, really your only option is making sure your diet's on point if performance is one of your key goals and reducing the load. I mean, you – there's a really big difference between trying to be impressive every training day mm -hmm. and training to be impressive on one day. Yeah. You know, so if you're training for an event, you really should focus on your training being appropriate for that. And you can downregulate that training and still get phenomenal, maybe even better results for your competition day. Mm -hmm. But if you're training to just be impressive every day, you, you kind of need to evaluate what that means. Uh, yeah. that, that's a really high stress load on the body day after day after day. Um, nobody would say, hey, I'm going to be awesome at life. If I'm going through the most painful divorce ever right. for the next 10 years, <laughs> you know, no, nobody would say that. It's like, I want to get this divorce over with so that, you know, I can have an ah moment. Right. Um, you, you can't optimize everything at the same time. Right. Although just, this would be an interesting discussion. Like if you're trying to optimize for anti-aging, like a lot of people will, will do fasting or ketogenic for that purpose compared to performance. Um, could you talk a little bit? about both because it seems like they might be at odds with each other i think they're completely commensurate with each other actually yeah. again you know diet key component i think um, both bringing carbohydrates into the diet regularly not 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 necessarily you know multiple times a day mm -hmm. um bringing it in at the right induction rate whatever that is mm -hmm. um and the resistance training uh, a lot of what I'm looking at now, so you can put somebody on a ketogenic diet and you'll see some improvements right away. You see a steady state pretty quickly of there. It's still in a diseased state. What you did was you made them a little bit better, but you didn't actually regress their disease state as much as you might might imagine. Right. And that takes uh, working on the metabolic pathways at the skeletal muscle level. So that required one of the best ways to do that is short burst, high intensity resistance training. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you get increased mitochondrial health. Uh, you get mitochondrial biogenesis, which can help protect against aging, using carbohydrates appropriately. Uh, you don't get the negative aging effects of cortisol or the other stress hormones as much. Um, mm -hmm. 
but you know that that component of having regular resistance training and i don't care if it's only once a week i think that it's an absolute key component with diet to the anti-aging equation yeah to the point of you know if if you're out there saying that you can be anti-aging without resistance training i think you're 100 percent full of <laughs> and you don't know your science <laughs> i mean i just i won't name names but i'm sure people who listen to the show um know some people that that i might be talking about I, it's just it's total it's total bs yeah um, it, it really is a key component and it it's especially a key component for people who are transitioning from being so unhealthy mm-hmm. to wanting to live a very long healthy life yeah. later on yeah it's an absolutely key key component well i can say from traveling around the world our perception of what happens to people as they age is so divorced from you know a lot of the rest of the world mm-hmm. world uh, in the sense that if you go to some island on the other side of the world a lot of people are still doing almost the same things that they've been doing their entire lives in terms of physicality in their 80s 90s you know if it's carrying water or or pulling weeds everything in between you know they don't really interrupt their own behavior and certainly don't retire in a lot of other places. And so it's interesting to see how, you know, some people kind of argue that anti-aging is in almost doing as little as possible, eating as little as possible, not wearing out your joints by exercising too much. And then there's this other side that it's, it's, it's more like, no, you just kind of got to keep it up the whole time. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And you'd have a very happy girlfriend in that instance. Uh, right. too. <laughs> well, there's that too. But <laughs> good pump. But I think it's I, I think you're absolutely right. I don't think I think what we see in this country in particular and in some um, some Western European countries is not indicative of real life. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think we've completely created this artificial environment where we just assume aging is this horrible process that will limit you for every year that you're alive. And I just don't believe that I'm. I'm so much better off now, older than I was in my teens. Yeah. You know, simply because I so much has changed, particularly my diet. And every year I feel better. Right. You know, I, I actually, since my early 20s, I can't remember a year where a, a new year came and I was like, I feel like crap. Yeah. And though maybe the one, the one exception to that was about a year. So two years ago, I kind of, a lot of stuff happened, you know, when I moved to Austin and everything, and I pretty much didn't work out for almost a year. Yeah. But but I stayed on my diet. That's the first year I can say where I didn't really feel better at the end of that year. I didn't feel like things got worse, but mm-hmm. definitely after that year, I didn't feel better. Um, mm-hmm. Otherwise, like I just, I don't understand this aging thing. Everybody asks me, oh, you're 40, whatever. I'm like, yeah, what's, <laughs> <laughs> what's your problem? Like, oh, you know, I had to start taking this blood pressure medication and stuff, you know. Right. It's like, oh, my God, I am so sorry for you. You know, it's, um, it's crazy. I recently turned 30, and I started getting a lot of the same, <laughs> same feedback from people. They're just like, oh, you're going to start <laughs> feeling it. You're out of your prime. I'm like, what are you talking about? <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> like, I figure I should feel it at about 95. There you go. Uh, at that point, you know, I might say, all right, yeah, I'm, I'm feeling the aging a little bit. <laughs> But you're ready for it by then. Yeah, Hopefully. yeah. Ninety five. Shoot, I, I. Tap if I make it to ninety five, I will be ready to die. Yeah, I will have seen <laughs> enough that I'm sure I'm like, okay, I'm just, I'm ready. You'll be a, a grizzled ninety five year old, I think. Oh man, I'm already so cynical. I can't even <laughs> imagine what I'm going to be like then. <laughs> well, we're running out out of time. Is there anything else that that anyone's doing wrong that you want to call them out on? <laughs> Dude, we should have started the show with that. You should have know, had a 12 right? part series on that one. <laughs> you know, I think the main thing that everybody is doing wrong and that I have been guilty of in the past sure. is really wanting to stick to your story or your guns mm-hmm. and then not paying attention to the people who are giving you crap. Yeah. Because sometimes they might be spot on. And if you just, if you really want to stick to that story that you created rather than a scientific hypothesis, 
um, you're going to get caught up in it and you are going to start doing things wrong. Mm -hmm. You know, I've been guilty of it. I think a lot of ketogenic proponents are guilty of it. Uh, They just, they like the story that insulin is the villain. When you, when you really do listen to the people who argue against that, it's like, well, insulin alone can't be the villain. We Mm -hmm. need to start looking a little deeper. Um, and you know, people who are high carb advocates, I have no idea how they can ignore what's happening in the world. Sure. So, you know, I would say that's the thing everybody's doing wrong. You know, they get a story. They love their story. Their story has become popular for whatever reason, you know, their YouTube sensation or whatnot. <laughs> and um, th- they're scared to deviate from it because yeah. their career has been built on it. You know, that that's what I would say everybody's, everybody's doing wrong. I've done it wrong. I try to avoid it. I try to be very, very conscious of avoiding that. Mm-hmm. Um, Paleo politics. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, it's just, you know, paleo is one. Paleo to me represents what can really go wrong (laughs) and no seriously i mean if you think about it so what you have is an unprotected brand sure that becomes popular because the original proponents of it however they constructed their hypothesis their their original diet was getting results Mm -hmm. well if people latch onto the story instead of maybe exploring why those results happened then you just kind of get stuck in the story. The story is very popular. The story is easy to understand and relay. Mm-hmm. And easy to abuse. Exactly. And the science is difficult. So it's really easy for a thousand paleo websites to pop up that all have kind of a consistent story of being natural. And people out there really don't know what's going on. And it just is a diversion from really trying to figure out the problem. And I think a great example, and this will be in the article series, I'll go through this really fast, but, you know, paleo's big thing is gut health and gut inflammation and mm-hmm. irritable bowel syndrome and all this. If you would look at diseased models in people, which are as close as we're going to get to transgenic mouse studies in humans, uh, glycogen storage disease three is one specifically where people can't store glycogen in their muscle tissue. Mm-hmm. And in my new model, everything starts in the muscle tissue and it starts with glycogen levels being full. So you get this extra dumpage of glycogen to other places, essentially. Well, one thing, glycogen storage disease three has a a manifestation that's pretty horrible in that disease is irritable bowel syndrome, gut inflammation, and all kinds of problems in the gut, Hmm. which was solved by the original paleo that really just had such a hard limit on carbs Mm -hmm. because it had to, because you couldn't eat grains, potatoes hadn't made it into the diet yet. Right. You know, it, it. Instantly limited carbohydrates, which then helped the gut. So, but now it's like the theory is, oh, well, it's because, you know, our gut wasn't made to eat this, this, and this. And, Mm -hmm. you know, we just need to stuff poop from somebody else into that guy's butt and he's (laughs) going to be instantly healthy forever. (laughs) You know, you go down just these crazy tracks of thought and action that are a really big distraction from what, what could really be causing it. Sure. So, yeah, that's, you know, don't get stuck to your story. Be willing to be wrong, and eventually you'll be right. That's awesome. Hey, that's that's a sound bite right there. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that. All yeah. right, before we go, uh, Kiefer, where can people find you? What, what should they look forward to? Everything will be announced through body.io. Um, and actually, I'll, I'll be doing, uh, I've actually taken quite a hiatus off my podcast, too, so. That's always listening to the podcast. So it's a great way to, to stay updated and it will start up again soon. But body.io is the portal for everything. So awesome. Kiefer, thank you so much for coming on. It's been a pleasure. Yeah, thanks, Abel. Always enjoy talking to you. Thanks, man. Hey, this is Abel James from Fat Burning Man. And if you liked this video today, please take a quick second to subscribe to this YouTube channel. Now, I have a quick question for you. Do you want to learn how to get fit and lose fat by exercising less? Get the step-by-step strategies for how to do that right now for free. All you have to do is subscribe to this channel right now, then click the link below to fatburningman.com. Enter your best email to sign up for my newsletter, and I'll send you a quick start guide to burning fat right now and some ridiculously good recipes as a special thanks. Once again, just go to fatburningman.com right now and enter your best email to get your free fat burning download straight to your inbox. Talk to you soon.
but this keeps it nice There's and warm. Uh, and it's about the same price as those glass ones, but I broke enough of those why so many to go for this one. It's last little while. I felt this. Yeah, when I lost my first video.